Good morning, everybody. Let's stand together as we come before God and worship Him. Welcome to the back here as we finish out the Christmas season and just glorify God for the greatness of all that He's done and as we think about the many, many blessings that are ours to come.
come. I, you know, I'm looking forward uh, to that day when the skies will break open and we won't just be thinking about the last time he came, but that we can see him come again. And what a glorious day that will be when Christ ascends and we can glorify him all together. It is good to see you here with us this morning. We're glad to have you as a part of our church family. It is our hope today that as we join together, our hearts can be unified and, and that we'll build each other up uh, in the joy that we can share with one another and just the knowledge of a God who loves us so much uh, that we'll build our life upon what he's taught us and that we can lean to him. So let's continue to praise him today.
from Luke chapter 16. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked the sores. The, dog, the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place. So those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family. For I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, many of us have never had it so good. And so we have become a little self-satisfied and happy in our own little world. God, may our ears remain open to your word and our hearts to you and to our brothers and our sisters. Do not allow us to forget you or place our trust in ourselves. Make us restless for you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Everybody had a wonderful and Merry Christmas that uh, the kids were excited and got uh, all your homes just filled with joy. They got everything they wanted for Christmas. I hope you got everything you wanted for Christmas, that everything was great. Uh, it is a most wonderful time of the year, isn't it? Uh, did anyone, though, get to see the Christmas star uh, last Monday night? I, I, you know, that was, I saw where somebody posted that uh, in a year where Satan brought us COVID to depress us, God has sent us the Christmas star to inspire us. I, I like that idea, and I was looking forward to it, and I'd seen all these beautiful, wonderful pictures of the Christmas star, and I went out expecting to see something glorious in the sky shining like this, and I stepped outside, and this is more of what I saw, uh, and I was kind of like, <laughs> and then, so I said, that's not exactly what I was expecting. It was, it was brighter than anything else in the sky, but it really wasn't all that bright, and then I learned that the way they got those big shining stars is from leaving the aperture open on the film of a camera for a long period of time so that it absorbed a whole lot of light. And it wasn't really what you're going to see unless you stared at it for a really, really long time. And I got to thinking about that. Uh, I think that's why a lot of people miss the glory of the Christmas star when it first came. Because sometimes to see the true splendor of something... You've got to look a little deeper. You've got to look a little longer, and, and that's why it took the wise men to be able to, to study longer, to look deeper, to, to see what a lot of people miss. And today, as we finish our Christmas at the Movies series, I want to invite you to look a little deeper into your life. Uh, don't miss this awesome opportunity that we have before God, because we're going to conclude this series by a look uh, at one of the most popular Christmas stories of all time, uh, at least over the last 180 years. 
1843, Charles Dickens published a novella that has been retold on stages from Broadway to probably every community theater in the nation. Uh, there's over 20 different video recording versions of Dickens' work, A Christmas Carol. Um, from the actors, from the likes of uh, Emmy Award winning Albert Finney and Patrick Stewart to the ever popular Fred Flintstone, Fozzie Bear, and Elmer Fudd, we have seen uh, some great characters play this out. Animations have been put together. Bugs Bunny, uh, Mickey Mouse, uh, as I said, the Muppets were in there with it. And it, even Jim Carrey did one where he played about four different characters in this animated viewing of the Christmas Carol. On Christmas Eve, we were watching TV, and we actually put up an antenna at the house to see what local stations we could get. By the way, even here in Springfield, I got like 53 TV stations on an antenna. Um, and one of the channels was, an, was like old TV shows, and I found the Six Million Dollar Man. Any, any Six Million Dollar all right, I'm showing my age. Most of y'all have not even seen The Six Million Dollar Man. But anyway, uh, he did a retelling of Dickens' Christmas story, even in The Six Million Dollar Man. This story has been around so many different ways. And The Christmas Carol was originally written to draw attention to the plight of the poor in England. Um, but through it, Dickens also challenges everybody to look a little bit deeper and examine themselves and what they value in life. And I, I'm sure you're familiar, but to refresh your memory. Uh, uh, the story was told in five stages, and we're going to kind of walk through those this morning. The opening stage is, is where we are introduced to Ebenezer Scrooge, and he is a wealthy but stingy old man. He never married, and his life revolves around work. When it comes to the Christmas holiday, Scrooge simply views the Christmas holiday as an excuse for lazy people to take off work and have a day off. Uh, his uncaring stinginess is displayed in, in multiple interactions in the first little bit. His, his employee, Bob Cratchit, is shivering in the side workroom, and he asks for just for more coal to be able to burn the fire a little brighter so he could be warm. And, he's, and, and, and uh, Scrooge turns him down and tells him not to put any more coal on the fire. He doesn't even want him to be warm. Um, Scrooge is just so tight and so stingy when his nephew comes seeking uh, donations for the poor and the needy, the orphans, uh, then, then Scrooge is, tells them, aren't there workhouses for the orphanages, for the orphans to go and find work to be able to work in? And he's just, he is truly a hardened man. His nephew, while he's there, invites his uncle Ebenezer to come to Christmas dinner as he does each and every year, but the invitation is again refused as a wasteful frivolity from Scrooge's point of view. And the, the closing scenes of this first stave are with Ebenezer having been visited by the ghost of his old business partner, Jacob Marley. And this haunted figure, dragging chains of his own punishment, of his own making, warns his old friend that well, what awaits for him because of his hard-heartedness. And he informs him that, uh, if, that that very evening he's going to be visited by three spirits that are going to show him some truths. And what I find beautifully interesting is the way that Dickens took a different approach to the parable that Chris read to us earlier. In Jesus' parable from Luke 16, Jesus says that no one can go back to warn the brothers as the rich man had asked. But what Dickens wonders and what he kind of fleshes out in this story is what if, what if God did allow somebody to go back to warn people about their ways in life? And so he, he fleshes this out, and, and in Jesus' parable, no one's allowed to return to warn the brothers, and he says that the prophet should be enough, but Dickens says, what if somebody went back? And so in the second stage, we begin to see these spirits of Christmas uh, appear. The first is the spirit of Christmas past, in which Ebenezer was taken back to the memories of his life. Most implicitly, the most important memory he's taken back to see is when his fiance returned the engagement ring to him because she's convinced that Ebenezer loved his money more than he loved her. And it was with a great disappointment then that he, that he watched her leave, and then Ebenezer began to pour himself sacrificially into his work, becoming bitter and hard-hearted. He became very miserable as well. You know, we, we kind of start to see the truth of what Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6.10, that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And the evil desires, they lead us to destroy other people because one thing that we do see in Scrooge's life is that misery loves company. And when we're down, when we're upset, we tend to make people around us miserable as well. We may not even mean to do it, but it tends to play out that way. I can remember for years when Rhoda would go to visit her mom and dad back in Virginia, the days leading up to them leaving, I would start to get sad. 
I, I was going to miss them. And, and in my sadness, I would actually start to be short-tempered with my wife and my kids. I would actually begin to work longer hours because I was subconsciously angry with them because they were going to leave me alone and I didn't like it. And what I was actually doing was making them miserable. Rhoda was probably happy to get away from me when time came time for her to actually leave. She may not have wanted to come back as mean as I was acting sometimes. Uh, but it, it was, I finally realized that I was just being hateful because I was sad. In my misery, I was making everybody around me miserable, and I would pour myself into my work, uh, either here at the church. I don't know how many times I repainted rooms of the house when my family would go away for three or four days, redo the kitchen one time. I mean, it was, I just poured myself into whatever I could find to do with my hands. And, and it, was, it was unhappy, and I, I, see, I, I see this happening in Scrooge's life as well. You know, we'll joke sometimes about the syndrome, but if mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Uh, it, but yet, we make that true, and, and we all become the center of that sometimes. When we're unhappy, we tear others down, we hurt others, and we can't see any good in things. What Ebenezer Scrooge allows to happen is his internal feelings about himself get directed outward towards other people. You ever done that? How you're feeling about yourself, your mood begins to get transferred, and the disappointments and the dissatisfactions of life get placed on others. And it steals their joy. It makes them unhappy. Makes you hard to live with, hard to be around. And sometimes that's that's it, we do it on purpose. But sometimes it's just subconscious, and it happens. Th this reflection upon the past, though, in Scrooge's life raises questions for him about his choices and his attitude and the way that he's been treating other people, which prepares him then for this third stage, the spirit of Christmas present to appear. And this is a, a jovial, huge, giant, larger-than-life spirit celebrating Christmas with all of its festivities, with a warm hearth and a feast and things surrounding him. This, the spirit then transports Ebenezer to see the Christmas celebrations of his nephew and his family. While he's there, he, he hears the conversation between his nephew and his, and his wife, and, and the nephew says, I wish Uncle Scrooge was here. And she questions, do you really wish he was here? He's such an angry and bitter old man. And she says, but that's because nobody, he has no one to love. And he doesn't understand it. And, and she says, I suppose you're right. And they lament that their uncle isn't there with them. And they see this lonely, bitter existence. And they lament that he has no joy in his life. Then the spirit takes uh, Scrooge to the home of his employee, Bob Cratchit, in the meager existence that Bob lives on. He barely able to survive but yet they still celebrate, not in extravagance, but with a simplicity and love for one another. Even their young son, Tiny, Tiny Tim, in his sickliness, is thankful and he prays for Mr. Scrooge. The Spirit also reveals then two orphan children who were living on the street. and they're, In the book, they're named Ignorance and Want. And at this point, Ebenezer Scrooge's heart begins to soften. He questions, is there no one to care for them, no refuge, no resource? And the spirit retorts with the burning callousness of Ebenezer's own words whenever he was asked to donate. He says, are there no workhouses? And it stings as Ebenezer hears his own words used back at him. And in this section, Ebenezer realizes that he's been so self-absorbed, consumed by his own misery, that he never considered others or what they might be going through. I wonder if you realize that how we can sometimes get consumed by our own issues in life. You know, I was common phrase that people use today is, well, I'm just having first world problems. But we still focus on our first world problems. We're, we don't have real issues, but we can still become consumed by our own unhappiness because, well, the air conditioning isn't working right in the house or, or there's a low tire sign on the car and we need to get air in the tire and it's cold outside. And those are our annoyances that we go through. But have, you, have you realized how self-consumed we've become over the last few months? When social distancing and all of these things started at the very beginning, there we people made a real effort to reach out, to contact other people, to check on them. People were making phone calls to check on neighbors. We would talk to each other across the yards all summer long, but as, as this time went on, few and fewer phone calls were made. People checked on each other less and less. Most of us have withdrawn to our own little spheres and we don't really, we haven't really reached out to others nearly as much, and the cold weather has now driven us inside, and, and we've lost a lot of the acquaintances that we used to have that would have kept us together. And, and we know that 
we know this is true and we know the scripture, but often we forget that each of us are to look not only to our own interest, but also to the interest of others. You know, it's, it's not just good advice, it's actually a command in scripture that we should have the attitude in the heart of a servant that we would reach out and care for other people. And most of us, like Scrooge, we don't see it until someone else points it out. But finally, sensing his hard heartedness and beginning to look around himself to others, we enter into the fourth state where Ebenezer Scrooge meets the spirit of Christmas yet to come. And it's a, it's a sad scene with Ebenezer's tombstone in, in the graveyard, but no one there. And the spirit reveals it to him that people are relieved. They're not saddened that he's gone. Nobody is going to miss him. And soon the visit grows even more horrifying, shuddering Ebenezer to his core as he perceives his upcoming agony. And in this pivotal scene, it closes with him having this deep desire to repent and live differently. And that opens then to the fifth stave, and it reveals a very different Ebenezer Scrooge. It, rejoicing in another day and just another opportunity, he sets out to bless everyone that he sees. He, he, he takes the wealth that he used to think made life valuable, and he begins to generously give it away because he sees the value in other people. He sends blessings and gifts to Bob Cratchit. He goes to his nephew's home who so often had tried to include his uncle before and they're shocked and surprised when he shows up. And he sets out then to provide even for the orphans and those in need. And it's understandable why this story then has become such a staple in the Christmas season, isn't it? It gets us to look beyond ourselves, to look deeper, to look around us and see things. It reveals the value of people and caring for others in life. And so when, when Christmas rolls around, we, we begin to share gifts and we give generously. It's, it's kind of interesting that that's the same point, really, that Jesus' parable from Luke 16 makes. That there are people around us who are in need and we should care for their needs. But Jesus didn't want his teaching to simply be associated with a festivity or a holiday. And that's the, the shortfall of a Christmas carol. Because so often at Christmas time, we do think about giving and sharing and doing things for others. We, we begin to focus on things outside of ourselves. But many times when Christmas is over, we go right back into our own selfish little world. And we live in our own little snow globe separated from everybody else. And we forget that the second greatest commandment that Jesus gave us is to love others as you love yourself. And that isn't a command that was limited to Christmas, but something that we need to choose to do each and every day. Ebenezer Scrooge in the end is a picture of what every Christian should be, a changed person, a, a life that's truly changed from focusing on herself to focusing on others, a, from going from being self-consumed and greedy to being a person who's generous, from being unconcerned to being caring, from being unhappy, he finds joy in life. And instead of living a life of meaningless, as Solomon warns us about in Ecclesiastes, he has a life of purpose. And we can begin then to grasp the truth of Jesus' rhetorical question when he asks, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? You know, we should choose to love others. We need to choose to be a blessing because when Jesus shared his parable of the rich man and Lazarus, he warns that there aren't really second chances after death. There aren't too many chances where you get a, a second chance to change everything in life, to reflect and look at everything. And, and he even says, if you don't understand the importance of carrying others from Moses and the prophets, that, that not even someone returning from the dead will convince people. And I, I love the nuance of, and, and the, the, the prophet, prophetic vision here that Jesus is almost laying out. I, I almost think this entire parable is almost a tongue-in-cheek. I'm going to prove to these people that they don't even understand it. This is the only parable where Jesus uses a first-person name to identify somebody, the rich man and Lazarus. And the question and request was, send Lazarus back so that people can see and they might know. Jesus did this knowing that in just the days and months ahead that he would let raise Lazarus from the dead, but even then people wouldn't believe. And that when he raised from the dead, there would still be people who wouldn't fully understand and they wouldn't really believe. And some people still don't get it. You know, there's so many Christians who still don't get it that our lives need to be lived as a blessing to others. That we need to be a blessing to others. 
And I hope that the inspiration of Christmas isn't going to be put away this year. They, they have actually asked, if you haven't heard, they've asked that you leave your Christmas lights up for at least another month, maybe two more, just to inspire, especially health work, healthcare workers and first responders as they're traveling around, that the Christmas lights inspire people, and we want to keep the hopes up as we go through this. If nothing else, it's just a great excuse to wait a couple months until it's warmer to take your lights down. So keep the lights burning. Keep it out. Don't put Christmas away this year. But the inspiration of Christmas isn't going to be in the lights. The inspiration of Christmas is in your actions and your love for other people and how you treat others. The inspiration has to come from how we act. And so the question really isn't, will you leave your lights up into 2021, but how are you going to live in 2021? They say hindsight is 2020. After this last year, I'm glad that 2020 is in our hindsight. It's, but as we look at it, it should give us a chance to see a little more clearly, to learn from the past and do better in the future. The year 2020 is virtually behind us. But what have you learned from it? What have you gained as far as insight into how you want to live for the future? What changes do you want to make? When Ebenezer Scrooge looked back, he saw how he placed the value in the wrong things. Unfortunately, we tend to do the same thing. We'll, we'll value the wrong things and we'll focus on things that aren't nearly as important. And as we look forward to 2021, how are you going to make it a better year? What do you want to do differently? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 through 17 tells us to be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. You see, God wants us to, to move forward. He wants us to do so wisely and make the most of every opportunity. And so I ask again, what did you learn this year? It's good sometimes when you're forced to slow down and think about things. And 2020 has been a, a year that kicked normal out of the way, didn't it? Everything's been different. Everything's had to be looked at and considered. But what did you learn? Did you spend more time with your children and realize that the, in the past they were maybe over-involved in activities? The, the, yeah, team sports are great, but family togetherness is even better than instead of being involved in every athletic sport in every season, maybe you should have a season where you just sit around around the table and you play family games instead of organized sports. Or have you felt the need maybe uh, to increase the activity in your own life, that you found yourself not having any hobbies or anything to do and you need to develop some of that and develop some relationships to go along with it? How many of you have felt the need to develop more meaningful relationships? So many of the acquaintances that we had because we just happened to go to the same places as someone else, those things have fallen apart. You know, I think that this year has truly revealed the difference between being church family and being church acquaintances. For many of us, we don't know the people that are sitting six feet away from us this morning. And we haven't checked on them. And we haven't really shown the love to them that God would want us to show and being interested in what's going on in their lives. We develop friendships, as Scripture talks about, that stick closer than a brother. Perhaps you found yourself being just a little too selfish. That, truth be told, you haven't thought of anyone else other than yourself this year, and you weren't antisocial before, but, but to be totally honest, you were comfortable not really having any real relationships with other people. And maybe empathy is something that you need to develop in your life. Or perhaps you've discovered that your busyness wasn't contributing to your productivity in life and, and it was actually stealing your joy. And there are so many lessons that we are able to learn in an examination. And you may find the things that you overlooked before, you, you, you find them more real here as we end this year when everything's been changed. You may find the things... And your lives were thieves that stole your time and, and joy instead of adding to it. But then the question is, are you going to find yourself right back in the same routine as life gets back to a new sense of normal? Because I expect that in the coming weeks and months, we're going to go back to regular activities. We won't have to be keeping the social distance for health reasons. Things are going to kick back into full swing. And, and I wonder, how do you want to live? When everything comes back, 
Because now's the time to set your priorities, to think about what really matters and find the value and the meaningful things of life and what you're going to involve yourself in for 2021. You, do, you don't get many second chances. You don't get many second chances to reorder life where things have been slowed down so much that you have to choose what you're going to put back in. So just maybe 2020, 2020, yeah, 2020, we don't want to go any further than that, has been a year that really and truly is a very great gift. A great gift from God for you to be able to reorder life and find what's most important. You know, as we come to the end of this message today, we're going to share in a time of communion. It's a time in which Paul encourages us and tells us that we should examine ourselves. And that as we partake of communion, we should examine ourselves and our relationship with Christ. But also, communion is a time that kind of like our story today, it challenges us to look in, in different directions. Communion will challenge you to, to look back and to remember what Jesus did on the cross. To remember the sacrifice that was made and to find to find the love of God there. It's also a time that it challenges you to look in, to examine yourself and to see the sin that is there that's separating yourself from God. It's also an opportunity that we get to look forward, that we can look forward to the coming of Christ because as Jesus said, He won't eat and drink of this again until He does it anew with us in the Father's kingdom. But it's also an opportunity for us to look around to look around ourselves and see the people that are surrounding us here today as a part of God's family. You know, communion is, I've often said, is the great leveling field of life. Because as we come together in a time of communion, we're all on equal ground. We all need the same thing. We all need Jesus. And it doesn't matter what mistakes you've made in your past or, or, or how good maybe you think you've been. The bottom line is when we come to communion, we all come needing the exact same thing. We need Jesus. And so this morning as we partake, I encourage you to, to look all four directions. Look back and thank Jesus. Look in and examine your life. Look forward to when Jesus is coming again and look around as you pray for one another. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for your grace and your love. Lord, it's so easy for us to get caught up in the busyness of life. This year has caused us to have to slow down to, to think and to examine. And Lord, we've seen that there's a lot of things that we took for granted that we did every day that really weren't that meaningful. And then, Father, we look around and we now see that there are people that we would have called friends that truly we, we don't really even know and we haven't had contact with in so long. And as we look around ourselves today, Father, here in this church family, we see our brothers and sisters in Christ. But, Father, we recognize that maybe our relationship is not so much a family but that this is just the place where we all have met up and so father as we as we look around as we look to you I, I pray that it would be our commitment to live for your glory but to also to love one another as you've loved us to recognize father the sacrifice that you made not just so that we could be in heaven with you but so that we could all be together in heaven before you that we would be a family and that we would commit ourselves to living for your glory and the joy and the way that we care for one another in the year to come. Father, may we share your love. And may we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbors ourselves. That's what it's all about. Those are the things that we need to value. Forgive us, Father, where we fall short. And help us, Lord, to live for your glory. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
to say that this has been a unique year, just to put it mildly, it's not. But as we examine ourselves before we leave today, I want you to also recognize that one of the greatest gifts that God gives us is the fact that He takes the old and He makes something new out of it. That He has a way of taking even dead lives and dead hearts that they weren't living for His glory and, and making them new and giving new life to them. And so as we head out today, we want to sing Graves in the Garden uh, because it is exactly what God offers to do for us, that He would make us new and, and that we would live with a joy this coming year and that maybe we we missed a little bit this past year. And so I invite you to stand with us. Uh, and as we sing this, just sing it to God's glory and the whole hope of all that He can do in the next year. As you get ready to leave today, I do want to remind you about just a couple of things. Uh, check the Christmas card box back there. The cards are divided by last name. I know there's a lot of them in there. Um, and also, if you would like to take a poinsettia home with you today for our Christmas season, we would invite you to take one of those home as you head out today. It's first come, first served. They're around the Christmas box back there. But if you'd like a poinsettia, please feel free to take one home with you. Um, we do thank you for being here with us. We want to continue to just glorify God with our life. And I pray that you will live valuing those things which are most important this year. The very presence of God and that we are all made in His image. Let's stand together as we sing.